preach to us about the processes of life and the, the graduation and the gradual development and the way that God builds and the way that God constructs and the way that God formulates those things that will be used as mile markers, lighthouses, voices of direction, and men that will stand out to be of assistance in a troublesome generation. I'm happy to tell you today that our guest speaker is a man that has modeled that type of life. Brother Howard and I were friends at Texas Bible College just right after the merger. Run quite that far back, but it was a while back. And I can tell you that Brother Gary Howard was an exemplary Bible college student, a man that was hungry for God in those days, and a man that stood out amongst his fellow students at that time, and a man that stands out among pastors and men of God in, in this hour. Brother Howard has been used of the Lord to build a revival church in the state of Oklahoma, and we got some Oklahoma folks here today. And we're, we're glad that revival is spreading across North America. He is also the founder and visionary behind a revival conference for his portion of the country called ARC. And we are so very, very happy to have Brother Howard here today. He speaks from a platform of experience. He comes to you today with a portfolio of apostolic authority and power. I want you to receive him, make him welcome in North Carolina, and let's open wide our hearts to Pastor Gary Howard. Let's love the Lord together. Let's magnify his name. Hallelujah. Bless thy name, O holy God. Bless thy holy name. Amen. I stand here before you today with mixed emotions. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be asked to speak at such a, an assembly as this. Uh, many of my favorite people that I look up to and admire and respect are part of this great district. We've got district superintendent and many of the other brethren on the board are past and former officials great men of God that we have learned to love and appreciate through the years, and uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, to be with my friends. I have many friends in this place today, and uh, too many to begin to try to name, but uh, very, very special people here, and uh, I'm happy to be here for that reason. I have a little trepidation because uh, I feel like I'm being thrust into a situation that uh, I'm ill suited for. But I will endeavor to do my best to preach to you what I feel God has put upon my heart this morning. Uh, God knew who was going to be here before we came. And he began to assemble the ingredients of this revival conference before we even arrived. Amen. And on the plane down here, I came not knowing what I would be preaching. God began to speak to my heart. I began to jot some notes. Out of those uh, thoughts that God dropped into my heart, I'm going to endeavor to preach this morning, and uh, it's going to seem so redundant and uh, it's such a repeat of what you've already heard throughout this conference that you may feel like I'm trying to copy someone else. I leaned over to Brother Booker. I had uh, done something I normally don't do, and that is I had uh, shared with him some of my thoughts uh, as we were sharing a room share with him some of my thoughts, and he leaned over to me while Brother Libby was preaching. He said, look, don't you be intimidated. You go ahead and preach what God gave you. That's just confirmation. <laughs> but uh, I know when God speaks to us oftentimes, when he's got a message he really wants to get across, he comes at us again and again and again. From this side, this side, this side, <laughs> he just keeps coming at us till you get the message. And uh, if you get tired of hearing this message, then once you get it, maybe the Lord will speak something else to you. Amen. Turning in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, I want to say thank you for the wonderful accommodation, the great spirit of 
hospitality and friendliness that we've experienced here. This is our first time to the beautiful state of North Carolina. Uh, it's everything they hope and more. <laughs> Amen. I, uh, beautiful, beautiful area. Praise God. Ezekiel chapter 10, beginning in verse. Verse number three and four, and then we'll be turning to the eleventh chapter for a couple more verses. Now the cherubims stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. In chapter number 11, what I'd like you to notice in these selections of readings from the Word of the Lord is the location of the glory cloud that was there in the temple at Jerusalem as revealed to Ezekiel uh, prophetically. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse number 22. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. I want to talk to you this morning about the glory cloud. Amen. Let's lift our hands and magnify the Lord together. Thank you for your mighty power, presence, and anointing. Do a mighty work. Open our hearts to receive your word in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. I realize that for most of you, this will be the first time you've ever heard me preach. And that can be a first time on anything. It can be quite awkward. Perhaps you remember the first date with the, the person you married. It usually was kind of an awkward type situation. I trust we can get beyond the courtship stage this morning. And just go right on in to preaching the word of the Lord. Forget about who I am and just listen to the word of the Lord. For some time now, I have personally been on a quest. And I have been enamored by and drawn by this quest for personal anointing. And also to see the glory of the Lord. This is a very important thing to me. And I believe as we move into the end time and confront and encounter the forces of hell that have been arrayed against the church in the end time, we are going to have to come to a greater understanding and appreciation of both the anointing and the glory that's upon the church. Amen. I believe that's the only thing that can raise up a standard against the enemy as it comes as a flood tide in the end time. And when we consider the anointing of the Lord, this seems to be uh, more of a personal thing has to do with the hand of God upon an individual that he has separated and God has called to a specific task or purpose. There is a particular anointing for every calling and for every task and every job that God assigns us to. Amen. And whereas the glory of the Lord seems to be uh, the uh, presence of God that is upon God's elect, that is manifested, his favor and his power that is manifested upon his people. And as we look into the word of the Lord and we begin to consider these uh, various aspects of God's glory and power and anointing, that we, we see certain patterns begin to emerge. You see, God is very predictable. Amen. The ways of God are very consistent. Amen. There's no variableness, neither shadow of turning in him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Upon this consistency of God, Abraham rested his case concerning his nephew Lot and his eventual deliverance from Sodom and Gomorrah when he said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the ungodly? Far be this from thee. In other words, he was saying that it's not your manner or custom. If you do this, if you destroy Lot, righteous Lot, with the wicked inhabitants of the city, you have made a departure 
from your custom and your way of doing things, the precedent that you have set in the past. So the ways of God are very, very consistent. And once God sets a precedent, the same pattern will be followed throughout all times, all generations and all dispensations. When we consider the great plan of salvation, I've been in an intense study on this for some time, and uh, the beautiful types and shadows that emerge from the Old Testament, we see the same pattern of death, burial, and resurrection in the creation of the world and in the flood in Noah's days. When Israel, uh, on their exodus from Egypt, we see death, burial, and resurrection. In the tabernacle plan, we see it again so clearly, and then we come to this great salvation delivered in this time, amen, of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. It's no different than the pattern and the method that God has used to save mankind since the beginning. That's why it's the eternal uh, uh, gospel. Praise God. It's the everlasting gospel. And so there are certain particular laws that, and, and principles that governs God's glory and His anointing. And I'm kind of using these together this morning because I believe that they are inseparably linked one to another. One thing about God's glory and His anointing is it will always be closely linked with Calling and purpose. Calling and purpose. Another thing about the glory of the Lord is it will always be uh, located in close proximity to God's law. Always the glory is close to the law of God. In fact, the Shekinah that uh, hovered over the Ark of the Covenant was there over the mercy seat, over the Ark that contained the law of God. And you cannot separate God's glory from God's law. In fact, Moses himself was on a personal quest to see and experience the glory of God. And with that desire burning in his heart, he, he climbed and clawed his way to the top of Mount Sinai and said, let me see your glory. And when he came down from the mountain, he was clutching in his hands the law of God. Amen. You'll never see God's glory unless you hold His law dear to your heart. Praise God. You cannot separate them. You'll always find them in close proximity. And then again, the glory of the Lord is something as Brother uh, Libby preached to us last night so ably, so capably. I've been so blessed with all the ministry since I've been here and all the messages that I've heard. But the glory and anointing of God comes and goes by degrees. And what determines the level of anointing as well as how much the glory of God can be revealed to you and I depends to a great extent upon our level of separation, our commitment, and our consecration. Amen. If you're not willing to separate from the world and unto God, you're not willing to make a consecration to walk close to God, and you're not willing to make a commitment to God, you'll never see or experience the glory of God. Another thing that Brother Libby uh, so uh, laid out for us last night, but I want to reiterate this because it's an integral part of what I feel to bring to you, is that the departure of, of the glory cloud can be so gradual that it's hardly discernible. It, it moves ever so slow from what it was to where sometimes it can end up. Uh, Ezekiel saw a vision that will serve to illustrate what I'm talking about concerning receiving the anointing and, and, uh, and drawing the glory of God to you by degrees. In the 47th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, he was caught up in the Spirit and he was shown a vision of God's sanctuary. And then out from uh, God's sanctuary issued forth a great and mighty river. And the Bible says there was a man that was dispatched by heaven that had a measuring rod in his hand. And he began to measure out. And he measured out 1,000 cubits. And of course, when you're wading and walking in water, that would be about one step per cubit. You don't take those long uh, three-foot steps when you're in the water. Uh, a cubit being about 18 inches. And so he measured out 1,000 cubits. And then the man took him and brought him through the waters. It takes a long time to go a thousand cubits wading in water even ankle deep. 
Amen. You don't get to the ankle deep water until you travel for a distance. And so the angel took him by the hand and led him ever so carefully and steadily until he was standing in water ankle deep. Amen. Your first initial experience with God, even though it may only be ankle deep, it's a glorious thing when this is the first time that you've experienced the anointing and blessings of God. But that wasn't where he was supposed to stop. Amen. That wasn't the extent of the experience in God that God wanted Ezekiel to have. The man again took his measuring rod and he laid out a thousand more cubits and he took him through the waters and when he went a thousand more cubits, the waters were up to his knees. Amen. You know, there's something about water up to your knees. Now you're getting into something that kind of, you know, you kind of get the, uh, the feeling you'd like to play and splash around in it a little bit. Amen. Then he laid out another thousand rods. Now it's getting deeper. It's getting more exciting and more challenging. And so he led him through a thousand more cubits and he got into water that was up to his thighs. I remember when I was a child before I learned how to swim, we used to go down to a little creek, a little private place, and, and our family would camp out there in the summertime and we would go play in the water. It was a spring-fed creek. It was crystal clear. And we'd get in that water while Mom would watch us there off the bank. And we'd get out there just about between knee deep and waist deep. And we'd get down on our hands and knees and we'd do what we call mud crawling. I don't know if you know what mud crawling is in North Carolina or not. Amen. But we were acting like we were swimming. I mean, we could really put on a show. We'd haul up there and say, hey, Mom, look, I'm swimming. I'm swimming. Amen. But we were making sure we didn't get so deep but what our fingertips would touch. And if we got in trouble or strangled, we could stand up and, and be out of the water and everything was all right. And, you know, that's where some people are content to go in God. They don't want to go so far, amen, that they have to totally cast all of their trust upon Him. Amen. I don't mind getting out here in uh, waist-deep water, and I don't mind mud crawling and splashing and having a good time and making a big show, but don't expect me to launch on out into the deep. Amen. But the angel of the Lord measured out another thousand cubits, and he said, come on. Amen. You can't stop here. You've come this far. I've got something now I really want to show you. And the Bible says he brought him out a thousand more cubits. And it was water, amen, that was deep to swim in. A river that could not be crossed. I want to tell you today that there is a place in God. There is an anointing. Amen. There is uh, uh, the glory of God that he desires to reveal to the church in the end time. That it is immeasurable. Amen. You might as well put your tape measure away. You can't go far enough, amen, to cross it. You can't go deep enough to the bottom of it. Amen. It's immense rivers of water that are big enough to swim in. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I've got a desire today to get out of this ankle-deep stuff and get on into something knee-deep and maybe perhaps go beyond to something up to my thighs. But wouldn't it be wonderful today if we could go far enough that the Holy Ghost could take us out into those waters that we could swim in? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm telling you today, you can go as far and deep in God as you desire. Amen. You are the ones that sets the limitations on God. When the children of Israel went out together, the daily manna, the instructions that they were given was, let every man gather according to his own eating. Amen. As you come to this revival conference, you're the one that sets the limits on how much you're going to receive from God. Amen. Some people bring a thimble to church and it doesn't take very long to fill up a thimble. But bless God, we need to bring a number two horse cup to the house of God. Amen. We need a spiritual appetite that never says it's enough. Amen. We need to go further than we've ever gone before. I hope I'm not preaching to people that's satisfied. Amen. With the fire of yesterday's campfire. I'm telling you, I need a fresh touch of anointing today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. How hungry are you? How thirsty are you? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall. I said they shall. God declared it. Heaven backs it up. It is guaranteed they shall be filled. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. 
God bless you. You may be seated. You don't press into the deep things of God overnight. It is a process of time. It does take time to travel. You must experience each dimension in God and become capable and able in that arena before God takes you on to the next level of service and anointing. Praise God. Somebody say hallelujah. Now, we know that there was a glory cloud that rested upon Israel. I don't have time to explain everything I'm going to cover today. I'll just have to move quickly. If you all know the word of the Lord, you can fill in the blanks and flesh it out. But there was a glory cloud that made its appearance as they begin the sojourn from Egypt to the promised land. Now, this glory drought with Israel, it provided them with some things, amen, that they had to have to be able to survive in that evil environment that they were thrust into. I'm going to tell you something today. I have full confidence that God will give to the end-time church the things that we need to cope with and to deal with the evil environment of the end time. I'm not afraid. I used to be afraid when I was a child when I'd hear a preacher preach about the evil that would be unleashed upon the earth in the end time. But I've come to an understanding of God that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen. We don't have to fear the devil. We don't have to fear the evil spirits that will come against the church in the end time. If we will make ourselves uh, available to God and we will seek after the things of God, he will anoint us. He will clothe us with his glory. He will give to us the ability, the wisdom, the power, and the might to deal with anything that the devil brings against the church. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I asked my good friend, Brother Hal, last night when he got through preaching, did such a tremendous job. And I asked him, I said, do you have any lists left over? I need one of those little books. Well, he's got a list. I said, I hope you didn't use all of them. Well, Brother Hal, I've got me a list. Praise God. Amen. There's three things that the glory cloud provided for Israel. Number one, it provided direction. Amen. As long as they followed the cloud, they were in God's perfect will. There's so many people that spend so much of their life in their ministry frustrated, wanting to know the will of God. Amen. I suggest to you today, just make sure every day that you get up, Amen. To look and see where the cloud is. And if you'll keep the cloud in your eyeballs, amen, you're in the perfect will of God. Quit worrying about a year from now or ten years from now. Amen. We need to be concerned about the will of God today. Some people fail to do the will of God. Present tense for always looking into the future. Amen. God has a will for you today. And he will lead you and guide you. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. So God's cloud, God's glory leads us into and keeps us in God's perfect will. Another thing that this cloud provided for them was a separation. The Bible says that as they begin to enter out of Egypt and they came to the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army pursued close behind them, that the glory cloud moved and settled down behind them and stood between them and the Egyptians and blocked the Egyptians from being able to destroy them and to fight against them while they were trapped and in such a vulnerable position. I'm going to tell you, sometimes the devil thinks he's got us cornered up. Amen. There's mountains on the right and mountains on the left and a Red Sea in front of us and the devil chewing on our heels. Amen. But I'll tell you what that anointing can do. I'll tell you what that glory cloud can do. It'll come and settle down behind you. It'll block what the devil's trying to bring against you. It'll raise up a hand against the devil and say, hey, you don't go any further. Amen. I've got my hand upon these people. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible says that this cloud was a cloud and darkness to Egypt. But it was a light in the camp of the Israelites. Now, when you look at the cloud, what you see depends on which side of the cloud you're on. Amen. Some people look at the church. Some people look at where we are, and all they see is gloom and doom and darkness.
darkness. Amen. Others outside do not understand. Amen. The glory of God that is resting upon the people. All they see is the thou shalt not. All they see is, uh, uh, you know, death to self, and nobody wants to do that. Amen. They look at it, and they see a cloud, and they see darkness. Amen. But if you're on, amen, the, uh, the side of God's provision, amen, if you're on the side that's protected by the cloud, all we see is a great, bright, and shining light that clearly leads the way and provides us, amen, with separation from Egypt. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The third thing that the glory cloud provided for Israel was protection. It intimidated their enemies, and it held back the wild beasts of the wilderness. We've got to keep, amen, the, uh, the anointing of God upon the church. We've got to retain our walk with God. We've got to have God's blessing in favor. We've got to have the glory cloud in our midst. For if we lose that, amen, we no longer have divine protection. The wild beast will come in amongst us and begin to devour. Our enemies will no longer be intimidated. I'll tell you what I've seen the anointing do. I've seen it back up somebody that really thought they were tough. Amen. I've had people come to kill me before, but that anointing moved on me, and they had to turn and leave. Amen. Because the glory cloud was my protection. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let me tell you something today. We cannot afford to go one day without God's glory resting upon the church. We can't afford to have one dead service. We can't afford, amen, to uh, go through one revival without a breakthrough. Amen. We can't attempt to do anything for God and stall out before we reach the top. Amen. It's essential. It's imperative. It must be. It is a necessity that we go all the way through with God and see it to its final conclusion in victory. Hallelujah. I told my church a couple of years ago, amen, we're not going to have any more dead services. Amen. We're not going to have any services where we give up and say, well, I guess we just didn't get there tonight. We'll come back next week. Amen. I said, if it takes all night long, amen, we're going to keep contending. We're going to keep pushing until we get a break. We've got to have the glory. Amen. There's people that's going to have to go out there tomorrow and face an angry devil. Amen. They need a touch of God. They need some faith in their soul. They need some joy. Amen. Which is the strength of the Lord. That'll give them the strength to be an overcomer. We can't afford not to have a breakthrough in this conference this week. Hallelujah. Starting to feel a little bit bold in the Holy Ghost. I enjoy everything I've heard and everything I felt. But I'm going to be honest with you. If I know anything about God, amen, we still haven't broke into that place that God has for us this week. Amen. There's still a dimension in the spirit that we need to get to. And you might as well be honest and say it's true. Amen. We need to put forth that effort to push on in to the very holy of holies. Amen. We need to see the glory cloud around here this week. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. I've been labeled in our area. Young evangelists came into our area. Some old guys that knew me took some time and pointed me out and said, you don't stay away from that place. He said, why? He said, he's, he's crazy. He wants to baptize you. And he said, well, what, well, what do you mean? Because him and his church, every time they have church, they think they haven't had church unless something big and spectacular has happened. If somebody doesn't get the Holy Ghost or get baptized or healed or get to the Spirit or run the aisles or something, they don't think they've had church. But I am guilty as charged. I'm not satisfied with anything less than what God has for us. Now, you can set down your ankle-deep junk if you want to. But there are some of us that has a burning desire and passion to get on into the deeper things of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's always those that want to sit there on the pew and just feel a little brush of the presence of God. But thank God we've got those folks, amen, that come with a burning desire and a hunger and says, I want something from God tonight. I want to see somebody get the Holy Ghost. I want to see somebody get healed. Amen. I'm not content to just come to church and mark time. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
If I could do anything to you this morning, I'd stir up the gift that was within you. I'd stir up the desire. I'd turn up the burners just a little bit. I'd like to put a little salt on you and make you a little more thirsty. My God, my God, let's worship the Lord together. Come on, we're getting there. We're going somewhere this morning. Come on, let's go stop now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let me tell you how the cloud protected them. Balaam could not curse what God had blessed when he saw the glory cloud in his midst. You just don't understand how much God protects us because of the glory cloud that he does. You just don't understand the significance of what God does for us and how he covers us with his hand of protection. But you see, when you begin to follow the glory cloud, it will take you down some strange roads. It will take you down a path that not very many are trotting upon. Amen. You're going to go some places that defies human logic and reasoning. Are you with me? You'll be misunderstood, misquoted, and abused. Amen. You'll be talked about and scorned when you start following the glory cloud. Amen. You know, sometimes I've got a dear precious wife that's always backed me 100%, but on a few occasions she just had to know why I was going to do a certain thing or taking the church a certain direction. And the only answer I could come up with was to tell her, I don't even understand it myself. I'm just trying to follow the cloud. And if you ever have apostolic revival in your city, you are going to depart from the norm. You're going to go down some strange roads. I'm not talking about strange doctrine. But I'm talking about things that the Spirit of God will lead you to do. Just like what Brother Howe preached last night. He did not know or understand that his worship, amen, was to signal the beginning of a great Holy Ghost outpouring. And you never know why. God just tells you to do what he said to do. And you've got to trust in him to take care of the results. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The cloud often leads us in ways that are contrary to the flesh. Because Israel did not understand the ways of God, they often murmured and complained against leadership. Amen. But it wasn't Moses deciding where to go. They could lift up their eyes and see it right in front of them. There goes the cloud. And they said, Moses, you brought us into this place to die. But it wasn't Moses that brought them to that place. And they were just following the cloud that was going before them. Praise God. There were some that wanted to turn back. But I want you to know those that stuck with the cloud, it took them all the way to the border of their inheritance. And the things that you desire from God, you're never going to make it through this wilderness. You're never going to figure out the way to go unless you follow the cloud. But if you follow the cloud, it'll take you all the way in to the border of your inheritance. Hallelujah. Let me hasten here. I've got to move along. But I want to kind of change the tone of this just for a little bit. I feel this very heavy upon my heart today that you'll receive the latter part of this message as readily as you have the first part. I feel that God will take this and do something powerful and mighty in our hearts and lives today. Amen. You know, we need to understand some things concerning the forbearance of God. The forbearance of God. That is a part of God's nature that stalls for time. Amen. Waiting for an opportunity to show mercy instead of judgment because we've repented. Amen. God does not bring judgment to us speedily, usually, because in his forbearance he desires by the hand of mercy to hold back justice until we have an opportunity to come to our senses and to 
repent. Are you with me? Amen. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. That is part of the intrinsic nature of God. Amen. He is a God of mercy. He delights in mercy and not judgment. You see, let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about from Scripture. God promised to Abraham and to his descendants the land of Canaan. Amen. It would be to him and to his posterity perpetually, forever. But as we read about this great promise in the 15th chapter of Genesis, God hastened to tell him, but you can't have it right now. In fact, he said, your uh, family, your descendants is going to go into a nation where there'll be a strange people and they're going to serve them for 400 years. And then I'm going to bring them out and establish them in this land. That's a very difficult thing to understand. Sometimes God takes us into some situations and through some things that makes no sense. But why was God forestalling the fulfillment of the promise for 400 years? If you'll read carefully, you'll notice the answer is contained there in the passage of Scripture. But it says, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, God said, I cannot judge this idolatrous, wicked, iniquitous people until the cup of their iniquity is full and running over. I've got to give them time for their ungodliness and their wickedness to go to full fruition. It seems that God is saying, I want to see how far they'll go before I purge them out of the land. I want to tell you something, my friend. You're in a bad shape. If God ever turns you loose to see how far you'll go. If God ever takes his hand off of you, there are no limits to how far you'll go. I'm amazed at the things that backsliders get into nowadays. I'm amazed at how far they go and the things they do that they never thought they would do. Amen. They go a bit above and beyond even what they did when they were out in the world before they ever came to God. When God gives you over to your own ways, and allows you to go until your cup is filled and overflowing with iniquity, then he will judge you. 400 years later, let me just insert this before I go on. There were still godly people in the land at the time of Abraham. Now, regardless of what your interpretation about Melchizedek is, he did have some subjects and some followers. And they were godly, righteous people. He was the king in Salem or peace or Jerusalem. Are you with me? Amen. Whether theophany or king I don't, or, or, or mortal man, I don't have time to discuss that. I've got my ideas and opinions, and of course I think I'm right. But that's not what I'm here to preach about. I just want you to understand that there were some righteous people and there were some righteous things that were taking place there, amen, in the land when Abraham walked upon the land. In fact, when he went down to Abimelech and he feigned that his uh, uh, wife was his sister and that king saw her beauty and desired her and then God kept him by a dream from uh, from uh, abusing this woman or, or from defiling her and bringing uh, a sin and reproach upon his own head. Uh, it was because he feared the Lord. And so I don't know just how much of God he had or how much he knew, but there was a certain amount of the fear of the Lord and respect for righteousness and godliness. There was certain amounts and, and pockets here and there of righteousness that was still in the land at the time of Abraham. 400 years later, when Israel made uh, their way into the promised land and they were involved in the conquest, we still see some remnants of righteousness. Amen. Jethro, who was a Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, understood somewhat about the ways of God and gave certainly godly counsel to the man Moses. Amen. Even Balaam, as perverse and wicked as he was, it's obvious that he knew the ways of God and God was able to reveal some things to him and to use him. There was a man uh, now that was king over what is now called Jerusalem. Adonai Zedek, which means Lord of Righteousness. He was ruling over Jerusalem even during Joshua's day. He probably wasn't a righteous man, but he still bore a title, amen, that spoke of a day and time when God's hand had been upon those people in that area of the world. 
You've got to understand that these peoples were uh, the Semitic tribes. In other words, they were descendants of Shem who was promised God's divine favor and revelation. And so God had to one by one eliminate each of the branches of Shem's family until he only found one man that was willing to forsake all and follow him wholly. And that was none other than Abraham. I want you to understand that the Spirit of God in this day and hour that we're living in, amen, is searching us out. He's trying the hearts of men. He's putting us in circumstances and situations to see what we're made out of, amen, to see what's really in us. And He's dividing the sheep from the goats and the wheat from the tares and the godly from the ungodly and the profane from the holy. We are living in a time of separation. Those that have refused to separate themselves, now the Spirit of God has sent forth his holy angels in the end time in the harvest time to sort out and to divide everything amen that's not of God and he will thoroughly purge his poor you better either separate yourself or God's going to separate you out hallelujah hallelujah Romans chapter 2 the great apostle Paul is preaching he addresses an attitude and a spirit that is so prevalent in our time. My, we're living in terrible times. I live, a pastor in the city that has uh, been uh, dubbed with, the, with this title, the charismatic capital of the world. I hate that spirit with a passion. Amen. If you're sympathetic to it, you just never have really seen the true spirit behind that movement. Now, that may go down sideways with some of you. Amen. But that spirit they're motivated by is not a Holy Spirit. And it is not leading them into all truth. It's leading them further and further into bondage and and lasciviousness and ungodliness. And I'm not interested in following that cloud. In fact, there's no cloud there. It's just a crowd. Some people don't know the difference between a crowd and a cloud. In fact, it's not even a crowd. It's a mob. If a man does that which is right in his own eyes, they go whatever direction they want to. They're not going in any discernible or definable direction. Everybody's doing their own thing and going their own way. But it's not so in the church of Jesus Christ. There's always a purpose. There's always a direction. There's always an anointing. There's always a cloud of glory. Amen. It's leading the people of God from faith to faith and victory to victory. And I don't want to follow the crowd. I want to follow the cloud. God, praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. But Apostle Paul said, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? He said, Because you don't understand some of my attributes. You don't understand that part of my nature that causes me to deal with mankind with goodness and gentleness. You don't understand that part of me, that mercy aspect that causes me to be forbearing and long-suffering. You don't understand the ways of God. Therefore, you do not know that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Amen. God's forbearance is this space for repentance that we read about in Scripture that is so awesome. He asked us the preacher, chapter 8 and verse number 11. He said, because judgment against an evil deed is not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That is the attitude that so many are taking concerning God's forbearance and long-suffering and goodness. I don't want to be one of those that despises or abuses the mercy of God. Amen. I never want to get so hard. I never want to get so professional. Amen. That I cannot see my need for repentance. I don't ever want to get to a place that somebody can't reach me with preaching. I don't ever want to get to a place that God can't deal with me in the wee hours of the night. I never want to get to a place that there could be a move of the Holy Ghost and my eyes would be dry.
Oh, God, help us today. You see, the perverseness of our unregenerate nature, amen, misconstrues God's mercy and interprets it as acceptance and emboldens us to continue in our erring ways. Because we misunderstand, we misconstrue the blessings of God and the mercy of God, and that becomes our uh, authority. Amen. To do what we're doing and continue the way we're going. It emboldens us. It hardens us. Amen. And we continue in our erring ways. Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in 1 Timothy 6 and 5, said that there were those that were supposing gain to be godliness. Perhaps you've wondered as I have, how come God continues to bless people that are obviously erring? Why is it that there still seems to be a certain anointing upon people that have turned uh, and begun to turn away from the ways of God? I submit to you this morning, it's because of the due season factor in the law of sowing and reaping. You don't decide to live for God today and start reaping the results of your righteousness tomorrow. There is a due season when you shall reap if you faint not. And once you've sowed the seed, once you've cultivated the soil, once the process of regeneration and growth has been set in motion, there is a harvest coming. Amen. You may change your direction. You may go another way. But that fertile soil and the rain and the sunshine will cause it to continue to grow and a harvest will be reaped. You see... Because God does not deal speedily with our erring ways. We think that God has put His approval upon what we're doing. And we suppose that gain is godliness. We need to understand that God's blessing oftentimes continues for a season. Even though there has been a turning away from righteousness. Another reason why the glory cloud uh, continues to hover for a while and is not snatched away immediately is found in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 22. And the prophet Samuel said, For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake. Just because we bear the name of Jesus Christ, there are some things that God will do for us. Hallelujah. A sinner can pay tithes and be blessed the law of sowing and reaping. Are you still with me? Have I lost you here? Amen. I'm trying to get you to understand. We cannot look at where we are right now and determine, amen, if our relationship with God is up to par and if we're walking in the paths of righteousness. Amen. We've got to ask God to turn the spotlight of truth and revelation upon our hearts and search us and try us. We need a spiritual checkup here today to find out if we're still on the road or not. You know, we think sometimes that uh, we've got it all figured out. We've done it so often and so long, we know how it all works. A few years ago, a very good friend of mine lives in the southeastern part of our state in the mountainous area. There's a beautiful lake down there that's fed by rivers that are spring-fed, and uh, it's just a beautiful recreational area. He and I decided we was going to do a little hunting. He knows that lake like the, uh, better than most people know their living room. He's a crazy man. He's a preacher. And I call him Jehu, for he driveth furiously. He'll take his bass boat at night and rip across that lake wide open. And uh, I'm crazy for riding with him, but I do it. But he knows it. He knows where every stump is, every snag, every bar, every island. He knows his way around. And so this one particular morning, he and my son and I was going to cross the lake to this real high ridge. And, and there was some deer up there that we'd scouted out and we'd checked on. But when we awakened this morning, there was an intense, heavy fog upon the lake. Well, I'm always just a little bit scared of getting lost out in the wilderness area. This is a wilderness area. It is a a declared wilderness area. So I slid my compass into my pocket, thank God. 
And this man that can pilot the boat in the blackness of night began to set out in that fog. And we traveled and traveled and traveled. And we couldn't get to where we were going. I mean, we should have been there 15 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. And then we passed this boat, and it was loaded down with hunters. And as we passed two ships passing in the fog in the night, as we went past them, they went putt, 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 and we went putt, 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 and it was going that way, and we was going this way. 15 minutes later, we see a boat approaching, and we look up, and it's the same boat, and they went by us, putt, 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 and we went by them, putt, 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 putt. Then our steering cable broke. And so I drove the boat as far as operating the motor. And my friend put the trolling motor in the water. And we had to go real slow. And he was guiding us with the trolling motor. And I was back here working the engine. Of course, we were undaunted. We was going to get to the other side one way or the other. <laughs> Amen. Brother Huntley understands where I'm coming from. Amen. I'm, 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 I'm preaching uh, where he really relates right now. I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road. And so, anyway, we continued on this vein for about two hours. And during that time, we passed these people about four times. And finally, they said, do y'all know where you're going? We said, no, do y'all know where you're going? They said, no, we're lost. This is honest to God's truth. I'd been trying for two hours to get him to pay attention to the compass. And he was arguing with the compass. Finally, I said, look, I'm tired of this. The compass says that the camp is right over there. Why don't we at least go that way a little ways and see? We didn't go 200 yards till we hit the camp. For two hours in a little cove there, we had been making a big circle in the fog. Around and around and around and around. And I want to tell you this morning, amen, we're living in a foggy time. Amen. You may think you know where you're going. You may think you're on familiar territory. But I suggest we pull out the old reliable compass of God's Word. Amen. And let's take our bearings and see if we're still on course or not. Let's check ourselves to see whether we're still in the faith. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You see, we have such a unique ability as human beings to adapt to our environment that we could have possibly adapted to some things, some subtle changes, until we're not even aware that we're living in a totally different environment than what God intended for us to exist in. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated. I read the Word of the Lord. A very tragic chapter. In the history of Israel, there was a time when they, through ignorance, through disobedience, through failure to seek direction from the Lord, took the Ark of the Covenant out of its appointed place, took it out on the battlefield to be a standard, amen, something to rally around out on the battlefield, and it got taken from them and fell into the hands of the enemy. And they went back home distraught. When Eli heard about the Ark of the Covenant being taken by the Philistines, he was so overcome uh, with grief and anguish, he fell over backwards and broke his neck. Both of his two sons were killed in battle that day, and one of them's wife was in labor. And when she heard the news of the untimely death of her husband, she began to go into labor, and she gave birth to a baby. And when the baby was born, it was a boy, and they named him Ichabod. Have you ever considered this scenario? And I believe I can show it to you from Scripture. Ichabod was of the lineage of Aaron and his grandfather Eli. When he got grown, amen, he took his rightful place in the priesthood. He moved right into the tabernacle. And Ichabod began to offer up sacrifices. Ichabod began to go through the perfunctory service and duties of the tabernacle. Ichabod ate the showbread and offered up the incense. In fact, Israel went for many decades without the Shekinah, without the glory cloud, but they carried on business as usual. It's possible to learn how to carry on without the anointing. And I suggest to you that that is a growing phenomenon in our ranks. 
We're teaching people how to play, how to sing, how to preach, how to pray, everything but how to live. We're teaching them how to put together a promotion and a program, but we've forgotten to teach them how to seek the face of God. How long has it been since you've been in an old-fashioned prayer meeting where you've laid on your face and sought repentance and sought the presence of God with bitter tears? Amen. We could look at somebody that has the right appearance and says the right things and is wearing the ephod. But you better ask them what their name is. It might be Ichabod, which been interpreted as the glory of the Lord is departed. I don't want to get to a place that God would ever take His glory from me and His anointing off of my life. Back to our scripture text, and I'm just about through here. But in the 10th chapter of Ezekiel, the location of the glory of the Lord that the Lord revealed to Ezekiel was in his proper place. It was over the cherubs. The cherubs dwelt upon the Ark of the Covenant over the mercy seat. And then as we go a little bit further, amen, In the uh, it is revealed. Uh, I'm going to back up to the 8th chapter. The Spirit of God has directed Ezekiel in the spirit and shows to him he says come I'm going to show you the abominations of Israel and he caught him up in the spirit and he showed him a wall and then he showed him a hole in the wall and he said dig and he dug in the hole in the wall and the spirit said son of man what seest thou he said I see a door he said open it up and go on in there I'm going to show you the things that the house of Israel does in secret it's the things Not that we are allowing in the open that's affecting us. It's not the sins that are being committed by the saints out in the open that's grieving the Holy Ghost. I'm going to go a little bit further. It's not the things that the ministry is doing in the open that is causing the Spirit of God oftentimes to be grieved with us. But it's the secret things that we indulge in. And it's the things that we do in the imagery or in the walls of our imagination. It's the things that's going on on the inside. Amen. That's where it all starts. It's on the, it's in your mind. It's in your heart. It's in your spirit a long time before you ever get bold enough to do it out in the open. Behind the closed doors, God showed him the sins and abominations done by Israel in secret. That's in the 8th chapter. Then in the ninth chapter, he shows him a group of executioners, six in number, that were sent to destroy the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What he was doing was showing to Ezekiel his justification for bringing judgment upon Israel. And God is just and the justifier. Amen. He is just and holy in all of His ways. And to those that knows His ways, He will reveal to them His secrets. And so He said to Ezekiel, Son of Man, I'm going to show you why that I'm bringing judgment upon the nation of Israel. And so uh, then He showed Him the executioners that were sent to destroy the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And there was one that walked among them that had a, a slate and an ink horn, a writer's ink horn, a pen in his hand. And he said, you go through the city first and you set a mark on everyone that sighs and cries by reason of the abomination of my people. I believe that the Spirit of God, I believe there's been an angel from heaven sent. Amen. In this day and hour, that's walking up and down the by roads in the cities. Amen. In the streets of America, that's coming to our United Pentecostal churches and our independent churches all around the world. I believe the Spirit of God is searching us out and the Spirit of God is putting a mark upon those that sigh and cry by reason of the abomination. My friend, if you don't stand up and cry out against the sin of this age, you're not worth anything to God. God's not going to put His glory upon somebody that doesn't hate what He hates and love what He loves. You better fall in love with a purpose and you better hate sin and iniquity and ungodliness in every shape, form, and fashion. We need a love for holiness like we've never had before. And we need a hatred for sin and ungodliness like we've never had before. I'm telling you, we need a revelation of God's holiness. 
We need a revelation of how sinful sin is. Amen. We don't even understand how bad sin is. We've learned how to tolerate and live with a lot of things. But to God, it's an abomination. He can't stand it and He doesn't intend to put up with it. And it's one thing when it's out there in the world. But my friend, he's not going to allow it to come in and take over the church. He's going to purge it out. You hear what I'm preaching to you today? I said God is going to purge it out. Every vine that God has a planted is going to be plucked up and cast out. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated. If you'll notice in the 11th chapter, 22nd and 23rd verses, that when the glory moved from the inner court over the cherubs where it belonged, to the threshold of the temple, the entrance, the door, it's on its way out. It's not abiding where it's supposed to. It's still there. We can still see it. We can still feel the effects of it. If they didn't look closely, they wouldn't know the difference. But God knew the difference, and Ezekiel knew the difference. And it was while the glory was at the threshold, hovering to decide which way it's going to go, that the executioners, if you go back to the ninth chapter, and I brought it in this in this sequence for a reason. If you go back and check it out, you will decide, you will see that it was when the glory was on the threshold that the uh, man with the ink horn was sent out. In other words, the jury's still out. You with me? Amen. God's checking it out. He's seeing what he's got left. He's marking it. Amen. There's going to be glorious revival for the tribe. Amen. The chosen and the faithful. But it's going to be a time of judgment for those, amen, that have followed the ways of iniquity and ungodliness. And then in the 11th chapter of Ezekiel, verses 22 and 23, and I won't take the time to elaborate. You can check it out for yourself. But what Ezekiel saw here was the glory cloud moved to a mountain east of the city. And it was when the cloud departed from the city that Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And this is a concluding part of my message this morning. And I want to say this to you, and I want you to understand me clearly. If there was an immediate and observable withdrawal of God's presence and approval, every time we sin or every time we allowed carnality to preempt our devotion to God, we would all walk carefully before the Lord. If we made one little step out of line, and God withdrew His Spirit until we made it right and prayed through, what carefulness there would be amongst us. But that's not the way God... You see, God allows His Word to pull us back in line. He expects us to be prayerful enough that His Spirit can lead us back into line. Hello? Amen. He don't jerk us back in line. We'd be nothing but robots. We'd be like a real strict mother. And every time one of her kids moves, she grabs them. You straighten up there. Not very many of those left. There used to be some. Nowadays, if you correct them, they won't correct them. They get mad if you do. Just let them run wild. Let them take over. That's the age we're living in. And that's another subject. I don't have time to preach it, but I believe it. Praise God. Everybody say hallelujah. Amen. I will compliment you. I haven't seen a lot of that around here. Somebody's teaching you right, and somebody's listening to what they hear. Praise God. But you see, God doesn't just jerk us back in the line every time we step a little bit out of the way. Amen. You see, if the first time, I want you to hear me carefully, and I don't want to be misunderstood. And and up till now, you've been a wonderful audience, and this may be the very thing that turns all of you off. I hope not. I think better of you. Amen. I believe you will receive me in a spirit of meekness. I believe you will receive what I feel God spoke to me to say to this congregation. In fact, I want to say this. I'm going to stop right here and say this. Amen. I, I'm one of those kind of preachers. I'll rush right on out there where angels fear to tread. Amen. This district has been known as a great revival district. 
It has been known as a great holiness district. It has been observed as a leader for revival in our movement for a long, long time. I have looked to this district for inspiration. When we were struggling and couldn't get anything going in our area, I kept reminding God, God, you're no respecter of person or places. And if you'll do it in North Carolina, you can do it in Oklahoma. Praise God. You have served as a beacon, amen, to the United Pentecostal Church and the Pentecostal movement in general. Amen. I mean that. That's a sincere compliment. Amen. Obviously, the hand of God has been upon this area and upon this district with favor. Praise God for it. Amen. But don't you know that the devil would like to put a stop to it? Don't you know that the very thing that got you to where you are, if the devil can, he'll insert some leaven back into the loaf. Amen. And he'll begin to spread his perverse doctrine and his perverse spirit throughout this entire district. There's two things we need to discern. We need to learn the ways of the Spirit of God and we need to learn the ways that the devil works. The Bible says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. But I see so much ignorance of Satan's devices. We don't cut him off like we ought to. We don't recognize that the devil's working like we ought to. We don't see him working in our own lives like we ought to. We need a revelation. I said we need a revelation of two things. What God is trying to do in the church and a revelation of what the devil's trying to do in the church. And we need to hook up with what God's trying to do and we need to kick out what the devil's trying to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. As I mentioned to you earlier, you will always find God's glory in close proximity to His law. They're inseparable. Hear me. If the very first time we allowed a day to slip by without spending the time in devotion, prayer, and reading the Word with God, if God lifted His anointing on us, we'd make sure tomorrow we're on our face seeking God. We wouldn't let that happen again. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. But you see, you can miss a day here and a day there. And you can come to church. And the church is anointed. And the Spirit of God begins to move. And that Spirit on the inside of you gets excited. And you begin to move and feel and be impacted by the Spirit of God. And you think, you know, it's all right. Amen. If you don't have time to pray, if you don't have time to work it into your busy schedule, amen, to read the Word of the Lord, just come on and worship. Amen. I believe in worship. But the way some people present it, I don't agree with it. Amen. Some people just want you to worship your way through everything. You can't worship your way past a lack of consecration. You can't worship your way past sin. Amen. There's an altar for repentance and you've got to have your own personal relationship with God. You can't live on somebody else's blessings. But some people have learned how to live on a splash of us so long they don't know when. They don't remember the last time they prayed down their own blessing. All they do is get excited when the choir sings. They get excited when the preacher gets anointed. They get excited when somebody gets baptized. But they themselves do not have a personal relationship with God. And they are living in a spirit of deception. A lack of understanding of the forbearance of God. If the first week passed that we failed to fast today, if God lifted His anointing from us, bless God, we'd fast two days the next week. We wouldn't let that happen again. But God doesn't work that way. He's going to find out if you have it or not. If the very first time we missed church, when we could have been there, If we had tried, if God lifted His blessings and anointing from us, we would never miss church again. But God doesn't work that way. If the first time we indulge in the insidious sin of gossip and begin to talk about our brother or sister and attack them, if God lifted His anointing, and His presence from us, we would readily repent and go to them and make it right, and we wouldn't do it again. But God doesn't work that way. Musicians, come on up here. I'm quitting right now. But I've got a little list I want to go through here. 
Amen. At the first time we twisted a story, added to it, stretched it to make us look good, or to get out of a jam we were in. If God lifted his spirit, his anointing, his blessings from us, we'd repent and wouldn't do it again. If the first time, and I won't look you straight in the eye because I'm not intimidated to say this, if the first time you turned on a TV in your motel room and you came to church and you couldn't feel the presence of God, you wouldn't try that again. I'm talking about the glory. Is this too rough for you? Can you handle it? You want me to complete the list or you want me to stop right here? I really feel like God gave this list to me. I wrote it down as the Spirit unctioned me. I felt the Spirit of God on me. I was shaking when I pinned this list down. And I've got to talk to you about it. If the first time you slipped a movie into the VCR, if God lifted His anointing and His blessings from you, you'd never try it again. But God doesn't work that way. If the first time that you stood there in the department store looking at a garment and debating as you looked at yourself in the mirror as to whether it was godly or not, but you went ahead and purchased it anyway, if God lifted His blessing and anointing off of you, you wouldn't do that again. If the first time some daring, bold sister trim the dead end off of her glory. If God lifted His presence and anointing off of you, you'd fall in all of repentance and you'd never do it again. But God doesn't work that way. If the first time that you put a little light makeup on and if you went to church and a choir gets to singing and the building gets to rocking, you couldn't feel anything. You'd run to the bathroom and scrub it off and you wouldn't do it again. But you know what? You'll probably shake yourself like Samson did and you'll feel the anointing. And you say it must be all right because you despise the forbearance, the goodness, and the long suffering of God. That's how these things slip in. Gradually. Insidious. Or as the man of God said last night, they wheeze on their way in doesn't need much of an opening. The first time you slipped on some kind of a decoration and debated whether it was jewelry or not and went ahead and wore it. If God lifted His Spirit and anointing off of you. You'd repent and cast it aside and you'd not turn back to that again. But God doesn't work that way. Young people, If the first time you begin to cross the boundaries of godliness in your dating relationships, if God pulled His Spirit and anointing off of you, you'd fall in an altar and repent and you'd never cross those boundaries again. But God doesn't work that way. In fact, God withdraws ever so gradually and other things move in. Excitement, promotion, the fast beat, program until we miss not that the anointing is the part of us. I want to ask you something. Whatever happened to old time convictions? You know one of the downsides of fellowship and I believe in fellowship and I love it. But one of the downsides is whenever we see others that appear to be blessed of God, indulging in doing things that we have convictions against. We say it must be all right. And we're emboldened. We're emboldened to participate and partake of it. We're tearing down our consecration, our relationship with God. Could it be that there's someone here this afternoon or this morning, rather, that's still enjoying God's blessings because of your past consecration? Could it be that the blessing
blessings of God you're enjoying right now. It's the goodness of the Lord that's trying to lead you to repentance. Are we surviving in that space of time called a space to repent? People, there's some things that may not be sin, but they will take the edge off your anointing. David's prayer, I close with, as he repented, he so eloquently expressed the hunger, the burden, and desire of his heart. Would you please stand? He said unto the Lord, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not, take not, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. North Carolina, will you continue to be the great revival district in the future that you have been in the past? If I know anything about God, He has spoken to my heart and said if you're going to be, there's going to have to be some heart felt repentance and some changing on some's part because there are those among you that are pushing against the boundaries. There are those among you, amen, that are not walking the way you used to walk in the same commitment and consecration and holiness and love. I leave it in your hands and in the hands of the Lord. It would be so easy for us to move beyond the shadows of the cloud at this moment. But I think the Holy Ghost has spoken. And we need to pause and stand still and to see if there's any water from the cloud that will rain on this conference right now. I think every hand needs to be in the air. Hallelujah. Talk to us. There needs to be some weeping between the porch and the altar. Can we pause long enough under the cloud and let the rain of blessing fall on us? Let there be weeping in this place. Let there be a sigh go up from our hearts. Let there be a cry of repentance. This altar's open. Let us not rush the moving of the Spirit. The Spirit is speaking to us. Let's make our way to a time of prayer right now. The Word of the Lord has been preached. It is confirmed in our hearts.
You have heard the preaching of the Word. Respond to the Word of God now. Respond to the Spirit of God now. The Word of the Lord really needs no affirmation when it's preached by an anointed vessel. And it's come to us today by an anointed vessel. We need to respond to the pure Word of God and a message that God has sent to us. Let's everybody come. Let's examine our convictions. Let's take a close look at where we used to be and where we are now. Have we let up on our convictions? Have we been pushed into a place of compromise? Let's get a fresh grip on Bible holiness and purity of heart and honesty. Let's search. Let's let the Spirit search. Let's let the Spirit search our hearts. Here we are, Lord. We make ourselves available to You. We open our spirits to You, Lord. Oh, God, thank You for showing us where we are. Thank You for warning us. Thank You for speaking to us. Only You know. Only I know. Let's be honest before God today. Thank You, Lord, for calling us to repentance. Thank You, Lord, for giving us an altar. Thank You, Lord, for giving us a place to pray. Thank You, Lord, for giving us a time to turn around. Thank You, Lord, for giving us new direction. Thank You, Lord, for empowering us. Come on, everybody, let's get a fresh grip on God right now. Let's get a fresh grip on our convictions right now. Let's get a brand new determination to stand for the old paths of righteousness and holiness and godliness. Leading not to the arm of the flesh, but depending upon Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like you to reach over, brother, and pray for somebody beside you right now. We need to be strengthened in the Holy Ghost right now. God, strengthen our convictions. God, strengthen our determinations. God, just strengthen our stand for you. We've got to have the Holy Ghost. We've got to have the power of God to stand. Don't let us be washed out into a sea of compromise. Don't let us be deceived by ourselves. Thank you for the Word of God. Opening our eyes. Opening our minds. Thank you for the direct message from the throne of God. Let us be true to you, Lord. Let us be true to ourselves. And let us be real, God. Don't let us appear and not be. Don't let us to seem to be and not really be. Help us to be real, God. Help us to be real. Help us to be real. Let us be in private what we are in public. Let us be in our homes what we are in the church. Let us be in the community what we are in the pulpit. Let us be for our brethren be what we are before the church. Let us be with our families what we are before the saints. Let us be real, Lord. Let us be real, Lord. Make us real, Lord. Make us real. <laughs> Don't let holiness be a professional act. Don't let righteousness be some type of wardrobe that we slip into and out of. Let us be real, Lord. Let us be real. Let us be real. Let there be no doubt or deception in us, Lord. Let us be real, Lord. Let us be real. Oh, hallelujah. This is it, church. Let's pray. Lift your hands right now and let's say, Lord, help me to be real. Lord, help me to be real. I don't want to appear. I don't want to put on an act. I don't want to be a showman. I want to be real. Not just to do, but to think. 
Let my thinking be real. Let my inner meditations be real. Let them be pure. Let them be holy. Within, without, sanctify my mind and my heart, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's everybody stand right now. I come back to that verse of Scripture that says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Again, I remind you, we have emphasized the praying, but we have not emphasized the humbling. We need to humble ourselves before. And the way we humble ourselves before the Lord is to humble ourselves before each other. So I want you to turn to two or three people here today and I want you to say, I need you to pray for me right now. And let's pray one for another.